قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد دي بذل سسز الإسلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Usually people ask and today's first question is from Um Aisha about this topic where she says how can new reverts seek true Islamic knowledge as they might not have access to books or works of great scholars like Ibn Uthaymeen and Sheikh Al-Albani. This is an important question especially in this era that we live in. People are given importance, prominence, not due to their authentic knowledge, rather to their exposure in the media. So this da'i is well known because he has so many followers on Instagram or on YouTube or on Facebook. The other one is quite famous because he has controversial opinions that he's not shy from airing and sharing with others, though they go against the mainstream, though they go against what real scholars of Islam say. And each one strikes his chest and says, we are the same, we are men. They have their opinion, I have mine. And this was said by one of the great Imams of Islam, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah Azza wa have mercy on him. When he said, whatever comes from Allah, meaning in the Quran, or from the Sunnah, there is no way that we go against that. Meaning that I'm a Muslim, I follow the Quran and the Sunnah. And whatever comes from the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, it's on my head. Meaning that the companions are all trustworthy. And as long as they don't differ in their opinion, I will ex accept what they say. But whatever comes from those who are after the companions, meaning the tabi'een, they are men and we are men. Meaning they're not better than us. They're tabi'een, they are normal people, they're not companions. So they may make a mistake here or there and they have the ability to judge and rule things according to their knowledge, I can do the same. But this person who said that was Imam Abu Hanifa. When Tom, Dick or Harry just graduated from an Islamic university here or there, come and try to change the mindset of Muslims with weird opinions that are baseless or based on whims and desires, this is why we always ask people, reverts and others, to look for real scholars. What do we mean by real scholars? Real scholars who are fluent in Arabic, know the rules of Arabic. And this is one tool of becoming a scholar. They know the Quran inside out. They memorize it. They understand its tafsir. 
They know the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, what is weak and what is not. They know usul al-fiqh so that they can judge over major issues through the rules of usul al-fiqh. They know fiqh according to the schools of thought and how it was derived, such rules, how were they derived. And they must be known for their righteousness, their piety, their closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal, the distance from anything that is haram. Those who are seen mixing up with women in their lectures and conferences, cracking jokes here and there, these are not trustworthy if they're not walking the talk. Therefore, Usually, we refer people to the real scholars, and we mean by that Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, Sheikh Al Albani, and others, mainly who had died, because we know that they cannot be tempted, they cannot be bought out, they cannot be forced to say something that is against their belief. Unlike those who are living today, there are so many that are steadfast. There are so many that are on the right track. But still, you see a lot of changing of color. And going back to the old school, and their publications have been thoroughly studied and scrutinized. And as Um Aisha says, their literature is available. And it has been translated to many languages. So the books of Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, of Sheikh Al-Albani, they are available in English, alhamdulillah. And you can easily go and study it. And most likely you will comprehend 90% of it. The 10 missing percent, you can ask students of knowledge and other scholars, and they will explain that for you, inshallah. And this is why we always tell people, stead, be steadfast. Be committed to real scholars. Don't be fooled by a sheikh like myself coming on live TV and seen by so many hundreds of thousands or millions of people and say, well, if he's on telly, he should be trustworthy. This is not true. Don't follow people just because they appear on TV. There are stand-up co comic, comi comics on, on TV. There are actors, actresses. So many people who come on TV, but this doesn't give them any reliability. When you see a news clip on TV, is it true? No. The vast majority of news that you see are all lies, except a small portion that they don't have an agenda behind reporting it. So go back to the basics, to the Quran, go back to the authentic Sunnah, and not just that, you have to understand the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the three favorite generations whom the Prophet ﷺ recommended us to follow when he said that the best of generations are the gen my generation, that is the companions, and those who follow them, that is the tabi'een, and those who follow them, that is the tabi'it tabi'een. May Allah Azza wa Jal makes us among those who follow them until we die. Mu'min says, since the coronavirus pandemic, we are praying at home. What must be done about Friday prayers? Can we give a small khutbah, that is a sermon, and pray Friday prayer at home with our family? This is a controversial issue because now we are in a situation that was unprecedented, meaning 
we don't recall any event in history that resembles it. The whole world is almost in a lockdown. And so many countries have not prayed Jumu'ah for three and some to f for four weeks in a row. So we get Muslims coming and complaining. Isn't this taking us out of the fold of Islam? The answer is no. Why isn't three Fridays consecutively being missed something that is a serious offense in Islam? The answer is yes. The Prophet said, والسلام, whoever misses three consecutive Fridays, three Fridays in a row, Allah will seal his heart. But this hadith was referring to someone who is doing this out of his laziness, out of his own will. We are compelled not to pray Friday. And this is what the authorities ask us to do for a short period of time until this crisis is over. And I pray to Allah that it is over soon. So this hadith does not refer to us. But what is the ruling? Can we pray Friday home? It's an issue that scholars differed due to the fact that some schools of thought require the permission of the Muslim ruler to conduct a Friday. Some schools of thought say that no Friday is accepted in normal cases unless the Imam delegates it. So the Muslim ruler is the one who delegates other hundreds or thousands of masjids in his country to pray Jumu'ah, to pray Friday. And some schools of thought even don't consider what they pray in the masjid as Friday. And this is why they pray four rak'ahs dhuhr individually afterwards. And this is all wrong. So the permission of the Muslim ruler is essential to some. Others say that the masjid is essential. You cannot pray at workplaces or at homes. So it's an issue of dispute. What seems to me to be closer to the truth, and I don't pretend or claim that it is the truth, is that in Muslim countries where the ruler is a Muslim, if he says no prayer to be conducted in the masjid, then you cannot pray Jumu'ah. You have to pray normal dhuhr in your homes because his permission is required. And the essence of Jumu'ah is congregation. So if this is not there, if four or five people pray in their homes in patches, this does not fulfill the purpose of Jumu'ah. But if you are in a kafir country where the ruler is not a Muslim and his permission to conduct Jumu'ah or a Friday prayer is not required, in this case, it seems to me, and this is my own personal opinion, it can easily be wrong. It seems to me as long as you are home, confined to your home, and you are three men or above, then you can conduct a Friday khutbah, a Friday prayer in your home where one of you would be the imam giving two sermons and then conducting the prayer. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Sa'ad says, how to be an imam for my family. Details on how to organize and lead a prayer at home during these times. Sa'ad, as long as you are going to lead the prayer in your home, the Prophet had told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, as by his actions in the hadith of Anas, may Allah be pleased with him. So the Imam has to be in the front row. The row that follows should be the row of 
males praying behind him, as in the case of Annas, and an orphan was next to him. So this is the second row. And on the third row, or the row that follows the row or rows of men, the rows of women come. So if you're praying with two men, men or above, you stand in the front, two men or more stand behind you. If you're praying with only one man or a male, a boy, then he has to stand next to you. Not a little bit behind, but right adjacent to you in the same line, in the same row. So if you're leading one male, he has to stand next to you. If you're leading two males or above, they have to stand in the row behind you. And if there are females, whether it's your wife, whether it's your mom, then she has to stand behind that row of men. Sometimes you ask a couple, a man and his wife, how do they pray congregation? Well, the man stands and the woman stands right behind him. She doesn't stand a little bit to the right or a little bit to the, to the left, right behind him. She doesn't pray next to him, though she is his wife or his mother or his sister. She, if she's praying with him in congregation, must stand right behind him. Ibrahim says, how to perform sujood as sahu Should we recite the tashahud twice and when to do these prostrations, before salam or afterwards? Sujood as-sahu is an issue of dispute among schools of thought. The vast majority of them, they don't have a dispute because they rely on the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, Abu Huraira and Abdullah ibn Abu Hayna, may Allah be pleased with them. Four uh, uh, companions, may Allah be pleased with them, that reported different ways of performing sujood as sahu And the majority say that sujood as sahu which means or translates to forgetfulness prostrations. These are two prostrations we offer when we make a mistake or when we forget something in prayer, or when we add something to prayer that is not part of it. So it can be at the end of the prayer, before concluding it with salam to the right and to the left. And it can be after offering salam to the right and the left, you offer two prostrations of, the, of forgetfulness, and then you offer another salam. And we talked about this so many times, but what Ibrahim is referring to, if, I, if my understanding is correct, is how the Hanafi school of thought performed this prostration. So there, is, there are so many different opinions in the Hanafi school of thought, and none of it is according to the Quran or to the Sunnah. But due to the fact that it is one of the four schools of thought that all Muslims accept, we tend to tell people to follow it. Meaning that if I'm praying behind an imam in India or in Pakistan, who happens to follow the Hanafi school of thought, in the last sitting, he offers tashahud. He doesn't offer salutation. He just said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. And he offers one salam to the right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. In other narrations or opinions of same Hanafi school of thought, they don't look to the right. They just say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah once without looking to the right. Then they offer two 
prostrations for forgetfulness. Then they sit and offer tashahud again and offer salutation upon the Prophet ﷺ. Then they offer salam to the right and to the left. This is not found in the Sunnah at all. Where did they get it from? Beats me. Why do they offer one salam? Because they believe that one salam concludes your prayer. But because your prayer is not over yet, you conclude it to the right. Because if you said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to your left, they said that you cannot offer prostration of forgetfulness. Because you spoke unnecessarily when you gave salam to the left. Now, all of this is part of their school of thought, part of their teaching. We agree. It's not backed up by Quran or Sunnah. Authentic Sunnah, that is. Yet, we cannot simply just cross it out and say, leave the prayer, leave the Imam. This guy doesn't know what he's doing. Go somewhere else. This is not logical. So the vast majority of scholars of Islam, of different schools of thought, say that due to the fact that this is one of the four authorized schools of thought in Islam, then you follow what the Imam has done exactly like we do when we pray behind the Hanafi Imam who is praying witr, three rak'ahs, like Maghrib. The majority of scholars say that this is not permissible because the Prophet ﷺ prohibited us to pray witr in the same format as Maghrib. So the majority would pray the first rak'ah normally. After the second prostration, they stand to the second rak'ah, recite Fatiha Surah normally. Then they do two prostrations and they stand for the third rak'ah. So it's not like Maghrib. Hanafi school of thought, no. In the second rak'ah, they sit for tashahud. Then they stand up for the third rak'ah and they sit for the final tashahud and offer salam. So if I am following the sunnah, but it so happened that this night of Ramadan, I'm praying taraweeh in a Hanafi masjid, and the imam prays witr in this format, what should I do? Nothing. Pray with him. But he's going against the sunnah. No problem. He's going against the sunnah because he believes that this is the right thing to do. Not because he wants to go against the sunnah. Anyone that wants to go against the sunnah deliberately and hates the sunnah, you should not pray behind him. So pray behind him and your prayer is valid with the grace of Allah. Insha'Allah Azza wa Jal. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them what to say when stricken with a calamity. Allah says, what means? And we will surely test you with something of fear and hunger and a loss of wealth and lives and fruits. But give good tidings to the patient who when disaster strikes them, say indeed we belong to Allah and indeed to him we will return. Those are the ones upon whom are blessings from their Lord and mercy, and it is those who are the rightly guided. Um Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, There is not a Muslim that is afflicted with a calamity who says what Allah ordered him, what Allah ordered them to say. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Allahumma ajurni fi musibati wa khlufli khayran minha. To Allah we belong, and unto him we shall return. O oh Allah, grant me reward in my calamity, and give me something better in return. 
except that Allah will give him something better in return. Um Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, continued. When Abu Salama died, I said, which Muslim is better than Abu Salama? The first household to migrate to the Messenger of Allah. Then I said, that supplication. And Allah the Almighty gave me the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in return. Reported by Muslim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Afreen says, what is the importance of Salatul Tawbah? Should we pray it generally or for a specific sin? What is meant by Tawbah? Tawbah is repentance. So when do you repent? When you make a mistake, when you make a sin. So is there a specific prayer for Repentance, the answer is yes. There is a hadith narrated by Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. And this was reported in Abi Dawood, the Sunan, where the Prophet said, والسلام, that whoever commits a sin and then he performs an excellent wudu, ablution, and prays two rakahs, seeking Allah's forgiveness. Allah will forgive him. So these two rakahs are for a specific sin. Whatever you do, whether a major sin or a minor sin, once you have committed it and you feel that you want to ask Allah to repent on you or upon you, then you offer these two rakahs. Now remember that there is a difference between repentance and seeking forgiveness. When seeking forgiveness, this is dua. I can say, Allahumma ghfirli, or astaghfirullah. I seek Allah's forgiveness, or Allah forgive me. This is dua. Does it include repentance? The answer is no, because it's something that I say. I may say it without intending it. While repentance is not something you say. Repentance is quitting the sin. So if I'm smoking and I say, oh, astaghfirullah, smoking is bad. Man, this is awful. I should not do this. And I'm still continuing to do it. This is no repentance in here. It has to be accompanied by great remorse. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, repentance, or he said, remorse is repentance. So without remorse, without the burning and the boiling of your heart over that sin you'd, you had committed, there's no repentance. So if I committed a sin and then I speak to others, <laughs> Wallah, yeah, yesterday I did this sin, wow, man, it was a blast. Where's the remorse? Well, I don't have any remorse. It was fun, but I don't do it anymore because it's sinful. But I don't feel any remorse in my heart. Your repentance is not accepted. Sheikh, how can I get remorse? By fearing Allah. I don't drink anymore, Sheikh. I don't fornicate anymore. I don't party anymore. But I don't feel the remorse. Allah will not forgive you your sin until you find the remorse in your heart. And this is attained by knowing Allah Azza wa Jal, knowing His beautiful names and attributes, knowing that He is severe in torment and punishment, and fearing His wrath. But when you don't know Allah Azza wa Jal, this is why you don't feel any remorse. And with all of that, you should ask Allah for forgiveness. You should intend not to do that sin again. The whole package is called repentance. So it's different than seeking forgiveness. So 
Whenever you commit a sin, go ahead, perform a pollution, pray two rak'ahs, ask Allah for forgiveness. Shaykh, I do this every night. What do you mean? Every single night after Isha, I pray two rak'ahs of repentance. Of what? Over any sin that I have committed. Previously, presently, maybe in the future, it's my normal routine. No, this is wrong. What you're doing now is becoming an innovation, bid'ah. Why? Simply because the Prophet made a condition alayhi salatu wasalam that whenever you sin, so this has to be a particular sin that you're praying and offering these two rak'ahs for repentance. Not generally speaking. And this is why so many of us make the common mistake of innovating in Islam. You think that this concept is good, you implement it without looking and researching whether it was done by the Prophet ﷺ and his companions or not. So many people after Fajr prayer, after dhikr is over, before they leave the masjid, they fall and prostrate, a long prostration. And when you ask them, they say this is prostration of expressing our gratitude to Allah. This was never done by the Prophet ﷺ or his companions. And continuing to do it, every single fajr or after every single prayer, this is a clear innovation that Allah is not pleased with. So be careful and inshallah, Allah will forgive your sins and ours. Husnain says, is it mandatory to wash our private parts for making wudu after we pass wind or is istinja part of wudu? Istinja is the action of washing the private parts after answering the call of nature. To cleanse ourselves after relieving ourselves, whether after urinating or defecating, we either wash with water the private parts until there is no trace of impurity, of najasa, or we use solid substances such as a stone, a rock, or paper tissues, or anything the like to wipe and cleanse the area. So Hasnain says, is it mandatory to wash after passing wind? The answer is no. It's neither mandatory, nor voluntary, nor recommended. Actually, it is prohibited and an innovation. And this is what most, if not all, scholars of Islam agree upon. This is an innovation because it was never, ever advised or recommended in Islam. And why do we say an innovation? Because Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, al yawm today, akmaltu lakum deenakum. I completed for you the religion. And my favor is also complete, and I have accepted Islam to be your religion. This was revealed to our Prophet ﷺ on the 10th year of Hijrah in Hajjatul Wada' in the farewell pilgrimage. So if Allah says, today I've completed your religion, this means what? This means that the religion was completed at the time of the Prophet ﷺ for you to come and innovate and bring up new things and say that this is good. It's best for your purity. You pass wind, you wash. This is an innovation. To my knowledge, only the Zaydis of the Shia do this. And they also, before performing wudu, and this is the second part 
of Hussain's question, is Istinja part of wudu? So I want to pray. I'm going to perform ablution. Do I have to wash my private parts? This is what the Zaydiyah of the Shia do. The vast majority of Muslims never ever attempt to do this. Why would I wash my private parts? I did not urinate, I did not defecate. So what's the point? The answer is, there's no point. And as Muslims, we do not do this. Simply perform wudu and go and pray, and Allah knows best. Shahab says, people say that we always tell them everything is an innovation. So why do we use new technology, cars, computers, internet, when these were not used by the Prophet وسلم, nor the three favorite generations? Well, Shahab, you have to understand the meaning of the word innovation. When we say that there are many innovations in space travel or in technologies, this has nothing to do with Islam. The innovation that we are warning people against are related to religion and not only related to religion, the intention of the person doing it is to get closer to Allah Azza wa Jal through means that the Prophet ﷺ did not teach us nor recommended us, nor there is a general guideline that permits it. Let us reverse engineer that. So, the Prophet says والسلام, in Sahih al-Imam Muslim, narrated by Mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. He says, alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever creates, innovates in our affairs, meaning in our religion, what is not part of it, it is rejected. So when we invent cars, are these cars related to our affair, to our religion? Nope. Whether you ride a bicycle, a motorbike, or a car, it has nothing to do with your good deeds or with getting closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. So it has to be in the religion. Example, the Prophet used to pray four rak'ahs of dhuhr fard with the congregation in the masjid, correct? Correct. Afterwards, he used to pray two rak'ahs, ratiba, voluntary, sunnah prayers. Correct? Correct. Did he pray it alone or in congregation? Of course alone. He never prayed such ratiba in congregation. Good. If today I pray dhuhr in my masjid, and after finishing the congregation, after doing my adhkar, I talk to the congregation. I say, listen, guys, we've just finished dhuhr. We are about to pray two rak'ahs, sunnah of dhuhr. How about if we pray it in congregation? Wouldn't that be fine? Wouldn't that be great? Because the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, recommended that we pray in congregation when he said that a man's prayer with the congregation is 27 times better than his prayer alone. So guys, what do you think? Isn't that a beautiful idea? One stands and said, that's a great idea, Sheikh. But the Prophet had never done that. Wouldn't that make it a bid'ah? And I say, hmm, you're right. It is a bid'ah. I apologize, my bad. So this is the definition of an innovation. To invent something in Islam where your intention is to get closer to Allah with it, 
but it is baseless. It is not in Islam. And as I've mentioned a few minutes ago, Allah says in chapter 5, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 3, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ Today, I have completed your religion. So the religion is complete. For me to come and say, um, guys, we pray five times a day. Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha. How about adding witr to it and say that it is six prayers a day that we must offer? That would be genuine and, and original. No, of course not. The deen was completed. You cannot add something to it as you cannot subtract anything from it. It's a package that Allah has revealed 15 centuries ago and it will remain till the end of time. So cars are not an innovation. Okay, Sheikh, I'll hand that to you. What about microphones? When we go to the masjid, we find loudspeakers, mics. So isn't this a bid'ah? The answer is no. What happens if there is no electricity? Iqama is done. And I say, And all of a sudden, the mics don't work. There's no electricity. Should I call the prayer off and say, okay, guys, there's no mic. Go home and do the prayer on your own. No. We say, Allahu Akbar, when we pray. Whether there are, light, there are lights or not, whether there, the sound system is working or not, these are not related to the prayer. These are means to enhance or to make the sound reach, reach people who live behind double glazed glass, for example, or in concrete houses. But it has nothing to do with the prayer itself. So I hope, Shahab, that this answers your question. Shaquille says, can we go to a gym where there are both men and women? Well, Shaquille, if you analyze your question, you'll understand that women being there is not permissible. Are they, mashallah, wearing the abaya, full face veil, and working out? Of course not. They're wearing a sports bra and maybe leggings or indecent clothes. And they are posing in inappropriate pauses because this is the nature of working out in a gym. With men around them, this is not permissible at all. The men themselves are not appropriately dressed. And when you put the two together, it's like magnet. It's inevitable. There is attraction between the genders. And this is what Islam prohibits. Islam calls for segregation between the sexes. Even in the most sacred places on earth, even the masjids. Listen to what the Prophet said, He says, the best rows of men are the front. And the worst rows of men are the last. And the best rows of women are the last. And the worst rows of women are the first. So the worst from men is the last, and the worst for women are the front, because they're close together. And the best of men rows, and the women rows are the first and the last, because they are distant from one another. In a gym where music is blasting, and women working out in the best of physical form. And so are the men. What is expected? Sheikh, this is modern times. We don't look. We don't have any feelings. 
if you don't have any feelings. You've got problems with your hormones, my friend. Too much uh, 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 estrogen in your bloodstream. You're not a real man. So definitely this defies all teachings of Islam. Sheikh, I lower my gaze. Come on. Do you expect me to believe that? Let's hypothetically assume that you lower your gaze and there's no temptation on your side. Can you guarantee that someone else will not be tempted by you? That no woman would look at you and admire you? Shaitan is there. So definitely this is totally out of the question. May Allah guide us all. Mu'min says, did Allah, did Allah's prophet and messenger, messengers ever sin? Did our prophet والسلام, sin? Well, this is an issue of dispute among scholars. The vast majority of all scholars of Islam say that prophets and messengers do not do major sins. And they all agree, scholars of tafsir, scholars of aqidah, scholars of fiqh, that prophets and messengers may do minor sins, but they do not insist on them. Rather, they are pointed out and Allah Azza wa rectifies it immediately. So Allah tells them that this was sinful and they immediately ask Allah for forgiveness and quit. And without going into details, the Allah Azza wa mentioned in the Quran that Adam, peace be upon him, made a sin and disobeyed Allah and then Allah forgave his sin. Prophet Yunus, he left his people before taking permission from Allah Azza wa Jal. And he was blamed worthy for doing that. But then Allah Azza wa Jal, while he was in the belly of the whale, taught him how to say the dua, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka. Inni kuntu min al and Allah forgave that sin of his and he became a better person. The Prophet والسلام, frowned, our Prophet والسلام, frowned in the face of the blind man, Ibn Ummi Maktum. So Allah revealed to him Surah Abasa wa Tawalla. And the Prophet sought Allah's forgiveness. The Prophet ﷺ accepted ransom for the prisoners of war of the battle of Badr, where Allah Azza wa Jal relieved, revealed the verses of threatening his wrath in chapter 8, Surah Al Anfal. And the Prophet said, والسلام, if anywhere, any one of us were to escape Allah's wrath because of what we have chosen, the only one who would be saved was Umar, who said, no, we should not take ransom. We should execute the prisoners of war for what they had done to the Muslims. So there are many examples. This is not the time to go into details. But yes, the prophets and messengers may do minor sins, yet they do not insist on doing them. And Allah forgave that for them, and Allah knows best. Muhammad says, is wearing glasses that have golden frames or a, wrist, a wristwatch that is electroplated with gold, is it permissible for Muslim men? Usually, and this is my understanding, and you are more than welcome to correct me if I was wrong, electroplated is just a color. So for men to wear something that is gold plated, if this outer layer or skin 
has gold in it, real gold, it is prohibited. So sometimes I may buy a wristwatch that is $10, $50, $100 worth. And they say it's gold plated and it's all yellow and shiny. If I take it to the jeweler's shop and I say, does this have any gold in it? And he tests it with some acid or some uh, sort of grinding they do to the metal to, un to, to find out. And he says, no, there's no gold in it. It's just a color. In this case, it's halal. But if he takes parts of it and says, yes, there is a very minute amount of gold in it, this becomes haram because men cannot wear anything that has yellow gold, real yellow metal gold in it. Suha says, my father loses his temper too quickly. And this is very often. I get mad at him for yelling for no reason. Am I sinful for this? How can I help him stay calm? And also, how can I control myself when he loses his temper? Suha, this is a serious issue. Your father is not one of your siblings. He's not one of your colleagues at work or a fellow, a fellow student at school. He is your father. So many evidences from the Quran and from the Sunnah that compels you to lower your wing and to show humility to him. The Prophet said, والسلام, the father is the middle gate of paradise. He says to the companion, preserve that gate or lose it. It's up to you. Meaning that you, Suha, will not be able to enter paradise except through pleasing your father, obeying him, being dutiful to him. Urwa ibn Zubair said, by Allah, he who looks his father straight in the eyes is not dutiful to him. This is an act of disobedience and disrespect. When your father is reprimanding you, yelling at you, talking to you, and you look him straight in the eyes, maybe express resentment on your face. All of this is un-Islamic. You have no justification, none whatsoever, in losing control or yelling at him or back answering him. All of this is haram. But he's abusive, he's rude, even though it's your duty in Islam to obey and to be dutiful. If your father is a sweetheart and he's always sweet talking you and kind to you and gives you presents, anyone by default would be kind to this guy. The test is when he's not. This is your test from Allah Azza wa Jal. You can choose. Would you like breast cancer as a test? Would you like to be prosecuted for your religious commitment? Would you like to be like the Rohingya being raped and killed by the Buddhists? Would you like to be in the Mediterranean in ships trying to flee fighting in Syria or facing explosion, uh, uh, explosive battles thrown at you day and night, watching your children, watching your loved ones, watching your family being burnt alive? Would you like to be in a country that is struck by drought and famine, trying to look for half a glass of water to feed the children who are skin over bones, dying in front of your eyes? Everybody has a test. Your test is your ab abusive father. There's no justification, none whatsoever for you to be disrespectful or to answer him back or to be rude or to look 
him straight in the eyes or to show any type of resentment, whether through your facial expressions, whether you, through your responses to him, none whatsoever. So get your act together before it's too late. This is all the time we have until we meet next time. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين